Welcome to another episode of the Weekend University Podcast, and this is your host, Niall McKeever. In this show, we're joined by Susan Blackmore. Susan is a psychologist, lecturer, and writer researching consciousness, MEMS, and anomalous experiences, and a visiting professor at the University of Plymouth. She is a TED lecturer, blogs for The Guardian, and often appears on radio and television. Her 1999 book, The Mem Machine, has been translated into 16 other languages, and her recent books include Conversations on Consciousness, Zen and the Art of Consciousness, and Seeing Myself, The New Science of Out-of-Body Experiences, which was published in 2017. Susan will be the third and final speaker at our upcoming Science and Spirituality event, which is taking place at the University of London on Sunday, the 30th of September. You can find out more information about the event on the weekenduniversity.com and you can get 10% off your ticket with the code podcast. Enjoy the show. Susan, to get started, could you just tell me a bit about your background and how you got into the field of psychology? Because I know you were originally going to be a doctor and then you kind of made a, a change at the start. Yeah, I, oh, that's where that we're really going back there 50 years ago. Um, yeah, I mean, I did in those days, if you wanted to be a doctor, you had to do chemistry, physics and biology. And I was doing the wrong A-levels. So I switched to the right A-levels and in the middle and got on fine with that, got places at lots of medical schools. And then I had a dream one night, well, kind of half awake, half dreaming. I kind of saw my future as being in hospitals all the time with sick people and I'd probably marry another doctor and it was like my life was closing in on me and I was, ah, you know, horrible. And, um, and I went home and I, I was at boarding school that this happened. Horrible, horrible, terrible boarding school. And I went home to my parents and I said, I don't want to be a doctor. And all hell broke loose and my mum was like, the rest of my life, the rest of her life, she was always saying, if only you'd been a doctor, everything would have been fine. <laughs> You know, um, but anyway, I, I um, got out of uh, got out of that. And then she said, well, you're not just going to mess around. You've got to apply for Oxford or Cambridge. And in those days, if you wanted to apply for Oxford or Cambridge, you had to stay on at school another term and do the exams in the autumn. Uh, so I did that. But I didn't know what to what to do, really. And my mum sent me up to London to do um it's like a career guidance thing when you fill in loads of questionnaires and I filled in all these questionnaires and I went into the interview room afterwards when they got all the results of, the, of these tests and stuff and the guy said I don't really know what to say about you because you could do anything okay thanks you know you've done so brilliantly and all these things why don't you become a psychologist like me <laughs> so, okay um, meanwhile the only teachers who inspired me at school were called Miss Bayliss and Miss Price. I assume now that they were a couple, but I, you know, never would have occurred to us in those days. They were the biology teachers, and they were brilliant, and I love biology. But they told me, this would have been 1968, 69, they told me that biology is finished. There's no more to do. Oh. I mean, when you, when you look back, you know, like, well, now we discovered the structure of DNA. What else is there to do, you know, kind of thing. Amazing thought, isn't it? Um, so I, I went to Oxford and I did uh, physiology and psychology, which was kind of a mixture of, um, of uh, biology and, and psychology. And it was great. It was perfect for me. And I loved it. But when you say my background, so I did that degree. But then I became, because of my out-of-body experience that I had, and which I've talked about probably too much, um, I wanted to become a parapsychologist to prove to the world, you know, that the, there's astral bodies and planes beyond and the consciousness beyond the brain and all this kind of stuff. And so I wasn't satisfied with uh, I was offered a PhD place at Sussex to do cutting up pigeons to understand memory. And I turned it down to, you know, and I went and did a master's degree in environmental psychology. And then I discovered that at Surrey University, I could do a PhD on telepathy and clairvoyance and stuff like that. I mean, basically, I had to do it by myself. There wasn't anybody to I mean, my supervisor didn't have a clue about it. And so I did that. And um, then I was a more or less full time mum for quite a long time and did bits and pieces of this and that and began writing books. And then eventually, at the age of 40, when my I split up with my first husband, um, I had to get a job. And I got a job at the, as a senior lecturer at the University of the West of England. And I didn't like having a job. I know that sounds terrible, but I really, really hate having a job because 
because it took me away from work. I like to get up in the morning, get to my desk, work. When I'm tired, go out and do some gardening or whatever and do some more work. And, you know, when you have an actual job, you have to talk to people and stuff like that. And I really didn't like that. So, And you have to go to meetings and you have to fill in forms and you have to answer stupid questions and fill in aims and objectives for all your lectures. And I'm going like... I tried to fill in the aims and objectives and I said things like inspire my students or teach them something. I mean, what are you supposed to write? I, I, I don't think I was a very good employee. <laughs> anyway, I cut the job down and down and down and went back to being freelance, uh, writing books, doing radio, TV, other stuff. And that's what I'm still doing long after I should have retired. Right. OK. Um, I would say, w would it be fair to say that your career has taken quite a U-turn from when you were doing the parapsychology and you were... I think I read online somewhere that you were sleeping in haunted houses and you were doing research into tele telepathy and these things. Um, but then you made a big change. Um, could you tell me about the moment or even the day when you realized that all the research you were doing wasn't really leading anywhere and you weren't you weren't finding anything? Was that was that a difficult moment for you? Could you talk talk a bit more about that? Yeah, I can. I mean, first of all, it wasn't really a U-turn. If I had, a, I never liked the word career because it, I don't really feel I've had a career so much as a, a life which has just gone on all different directions for different reasons. But but to answer that specific question, yes, it was horrible. Um, but looking back, very important. I started out doing experiments on telepathy to try to test. This is for my PhD to try to test my memory theory of ESP, which was. Um, roughly speaking, there's something like the Akashic Records, you know, it's kind of out, uh, related to uh, theosophy and astral projection. The uh, Akashic Records, so memories stored out there in the great ether, you know, and so we, we pick up our own memories from it and we pick up other people's as well and then it's called telepathy. That was sort of the, the, the theory I had. I didn't realize then that it wasn't novel uh, and it was stupid and it didn't make sense either. But anyway, that's what I was doing. And my first two experiments worked pretty well um, and it got significant results. And then somebody pointed out that there was a problem with the stats because I, I was using T-tests and um, not fulfilling the specific um, requirements for, for doing a T-test. There, there was a very small um, problem there. And as soon as I corrected that problem, um, I stopped getting significant results. So you got this great excitement at the beginning and then it kind of, oh, well, maybe if these kind of telepathy experiments don't work, I'll try clairvoyance and I'll try precognition. Or maybe doing experiments with loads of students, which is what I was doing, that doesn't work. So, but I'm so convinced, you know, <laughs> there's got to be something. So I started doing experiments with young children because young children haven't yet had their sort of psychic powers, you know, oppressed by uh, you know, the, the wicked world of education and all that. So I did some lovely experiments. The kids were wonderful, at sort of um, three and four year olds. They were great fun to work with. And again, exactly chance results, no sign of any ESP. Um, then, yeah, I went and slept in lots of haunted houses. I ran the Psychic Research Society in Oxford for three years and then in Surrey for many years. And we had all kinds of, you know, we, we went on ghost hunts and I sat in Poltergeist House in Bristol uh, one day a week for ages until I worked out what was going on with the Poltergeist, which was perfectly normal. Um, and, you know, all these different things. But to answer you, oh, and then because I was I was trained as a witch and I trained to use tarot cards and the I Ching and I could scry with a crystal ball and, you know, all these different things. Um, and... Um, I thought the tarot cards were, well, they definitely worked because I would do a tarot reading for somebody and they'd say, wow, how did you know that? So I knew it worked. So then I did a series of three experiments with the tarot cards and they basically showed that if I'm not sitting with the person interacting with body language and everything, it doesn't work. It, it doesn't have anything to do with the layout of the cards. It's, it's to do with the relationship between the people, which is kind of obvious if you think about it, really. But, you know, it took me those experiments to convince myself. Now, many people would still be convinced I'm wrong. And indeed, there were people who said that I cheated to try and make my results show nothing. Well, why would I do that? <laughs> because I really, really, really wanted to prove these things existed. So to come to the nub of your question, um, I was lying in the bath one day in my house in Guildford. And I had, I'd had so many times of thinking like lying in bed or whatever, or going for a walk, of thinking, well, if this doesn't work, maybe this will. And if this doesn't work, maybe this will. And there's always another, you know, somewhere to go. And I was lying there that particular night and I just thought, 
what if there's nothing? What if it's all complete garbage? And I, I kind of couldn't go back from that point, really, because once I'd entertained that thought, it was obvious that that was the most likely explanation for by then three years probably of research doesn't sound much now at the age of 67 but it seemed like forever at the time you know Excellent. and I was I was at the point of writing writing up the the PhD um, to submit it and yes you asked if it was horrible it was horrible in many ways because I think I'd been so utterly committed to the existence of the paranormal and the astral plane that I'd seen in my out-of-body experience and, and, and all that that it was really hard to think, okay, I've got to reevaluate all that, which I then began to do, and that culminated in my book, Beyond the Body, in 1982. But the other thing about it was, I was known, both at Oxford and at Surrey, as the one who went around in all my hippie clothes, and I'd always got my tarot cards, and I, you know, I was a mystic Meg, I mean, not quite, but, you know, I was kind of, oh, she's the, you know, psychic thing, one. And um, no, I wasn't anymore. <laughs> so I had to change who I was in in quite substantial ways as well the wonderful thing about this and I would say this to any um, scientist out there or aspiring scientist or you know student who's interested in science the heart of doing science is to be able to change your mind when you're wrong I mean that's how we make progress with everything really um, and I did that I changed my mind and I changed my whole life because I became convinced that I'd been wrong all those all those years. And having done it once, I'm not frightened of doing it again. So if any of my ideas about consciousness now are total rubbish, well, OK, if someone shows me that, I, I'm, I'm ready to change my mind. I could even change my mind back and think there is life after death. It seems pretty far fetched possibility. But, you know, <laughs> I changed my mind in a big way once before so I could do it again. And so in that way, it was really helpful to go through that very painful time so do you think the first time if you've done that once especially for something that you've been so attached to it gets easier easier the next time you have to do it and the next time after that and do you have any yeah. do you have any things uh that you do to keep yourself objective and look for disconfirming evidence whenever you are studying something and going down a line of thought that's a very good question i think the answer is probably not enough uh yes certainly that's my ideal um, but like most people, it's common psychology. If I'm sort of tired and looking at things online or whatever, I'll, I'll prefer to read things that agree with me. I get sent for free various skeptics mags and, you know, I don't get sent and I don't buy the latest, you know, psychics international or whatever it might be. Um, but certainly I take pleasure in reading scientific papers and trying to find out what's wrong with them. Um, in a kind of the fun of nitpicky stuff, but not as much as I used to. I, I think, and I think this is quite common actually in people's um, research careers that you have a phase probably when you're younger when when you really really enjoy all that nitpicking stuff. And I used to do loads of it. I used to spend endless time doing stats on a handheld calculator. No computers in those days. Oh, you know, <laughs> and enjoying that and, and redoing other people's stats to show they were wrong and all that. I don't do that anymore. I more work on the kind of higher level ideas about consciousness and so on. But then I really, yes, I, I certainly look for disconfirming things. Oh, I can give you an example. I've just read a wonderful book um, by Nick Chater called The Mind is Flat. And most of it, and a lot about the grand illusion, which I've contributed to that theory. And, and I really like that. But then in part of the book, he says it's impossible to have more than one thought at once. Now, there's a bit of a problem with what he means by a thought. But anyway, so my instant reaction to that is, no, he's wrong. It's, that's not true. You can definitely have, have more than one thought at once. OK, maybe I'm wrong. Right. I will make my med I meditate every day. And I was on a day retreat yesterday. I will make my meditation practice for the moment. I'll give myself a koan, kind of think about two things at once. And I've been really exploring that. I mean, I don't have an answer yet, really. I could some days I think, yeah, yeah, I had to at once then. I think mm, maybe not, you know. So if that's sort of getting at your question, I certainly do that and enjoy that kind of, you know, who's right, you know, me or him. Let's find out. Yeah. Uh, so now I want to talk a bit about Zen, Sue, okay? So could you tell us about, I think you went through a period whenever you were first getting into this line of thought where you did seven weeks of mindfulness nonstop. Could you tell us about that, that time in your life? 
gosh, you have looked me up thoroughly, haven't you? <laughs> um, yes, it was quite strange. Um, I was, let me think, when was this? This was 1986. I'd started meditating in a small way in the mid-70s, but I went on my first Zen retreat in 1981, and I was then working with John Crook. He's died now, but he was a fantastic Zen master. Um, he was originally a um, lecturer in um, uh, e ecology at the University of Bristol, which is how I met him. Very interesting to be, you know, a Western trained scientist and a Zen master. Um, and I went on a re retreat with him. And then he, um, we got together a group of several of us who were psychologists and biologists interested in um, uh Zen and meditation, and we met every so often and decided to organize a conference, and that took place in 1986 in Cardiff. And it was like East and Western approaches to mind and self, or something like that. Very early time for to be doing that. It's commonplace now, but it was not, not at all commonplace then. And we had all these different people there, and the word mindfulness kept coming up. Now, everyone's heard of it now, but then, like, what is this word? What does it mean? And the most I could gather from what I heard in these lectures, was that it was something to do with being in the present moment. And I thought, well, where else could I be? Um, I'm in the present moment, aren't I? And then I kind of wandered off a bit. And I, oh, hang on a minute. Where's that present? You know, and I realized there was something to be done here. And so I, I thought, well, I'm going to do this. Uh, how long shall I do it for? And then I thought, well, if you're thinking about how long you're doing it for, you're not being in the present moment. So just be in the present moment. So I began. That was extraordinary. I don't know. I suppose it was the surprise or the shock or the of the of the difference from how I'd been, but somehow it captivated me, and I started doing it. And I must have been a bit weird because I, you know, I was really doing it in a very kind of starey way, like keep doing this. You know, <laughs> I must have seemed a bit weird. I don't know. But then I had to leave the conference, and um, I was living in Germany at the time, and I had to get a bus to the uh, to the to, to London to get the um, the train or whatever I was doing um, and, I, and I was late and I thought I've only got seven minutes and it's a ten minute walk to the bus station and I better run and, and, I, and I can remember staying absolutely in the moment as I ran and not minding whether the, I'd missed the bus or not because I'm in the present moment and I either will or won't and it was a, that I mean even that much was a real lesson in not being obsessed about stuff and I ran and I just got on the bus and I said <gasps> being in the present moment with the breathing somehow or another I think it had captivated so much that I just kept going and um, I got the tra train back to, to Germany and then I had my two little kids there and we went on a holiday and all that holiday I learned so many lessons through the mindfulness of that one particular that comes to mind is on the beach there was a man with a loud radio and I've always hated you know I want to be on the beach we were on a lake in the, somewhere in Germany I'm not sure where and um, it was really annoying me, but I was being in the moment, and so I I was annoyed. But then I found I just got up, and very politely in my best German, which wasn't very good, but it was adequate, I said, excuse me, would you mind turning the radio down, please? And I went, <laughs> and he turned it off, <laughs> and it was all silent. I went back to with the kids, and, you know, and, and I was quite surprised, and that was something that I've... You know, I've, I've thought of that quite often in, later on because, you know, I, I don't, it's all part of the giving up free will business. You know, it's not me who's got to decide and then I do it. That's not how it works. And so I, I'm still today, although I'm not practicing mindfulness intensely in that way, I still find these things happen. She, it, body, you know, goes and does things in a reasonable way on the whole. And so it just carried on. And the seven weeks, I met a couple of people since who've said they've done something similar that lasted sort of six, seven, eight weeks. Maybe there's a maybe there's a natural time. But what happened was I'd been writing my autobiography, um, which is called In Search of the Light. It, it, it was originally called The Adventures of a Parapsychologist. And it talked all about the poltergeist and the, all the stuff I've told you um, that came out in, in, in 1986 uh, and subsequently a, a another edition in 1996 called In Search of the Light with extra chapters of, of, of stuff. Um, and the proofs of this book came and I had to sit there, you know, hour after hour um, correcting the proofs. Um, and I couldn't stay mindful while doing that. It just it just didn't work, you know, because I had my mind had to go away to reading this stuff and being engrossed in my story about my own past. And that was the end of the mindfulness in that form. 
but of course I've practiced it quite a lot since in more you know more real, more intermittent and relaxed kind of way and has that made your meditation practice easier going forward the fact you went through that seven weeks of intense all in mindfulness I imagine so, but I can't do the control experiment to find out. <laughs> it feels as though it did, but that's always the problem with, you know, I think sometimes when I'm, you know, things are going very smoothly and perhaps I cope with something that I think, oh, if that had happened a few years ago, I'd have been so, you know, I wouldn't have coped. I'd have been so furious or I'd have done something to, you know, and now I don't, I've, cal- I've calmly, you know, and I think, oh, it's all that meditation practice. Maybe it's just getting older, you know. <laughs> I, I can't really run the, the experiment to find out. Uh, the next thing I want to ask you is, can you talk us through the process you used to tackle the, the 10 questions in Zen and the Art of Consciousness? Mm. Well, there are two complete, for anyone who doesn't know about that book, it's originally called 10 Zen Questions, uh, and it is literally, it's an introduction about consciousness, and then there's these 10 questions. They divide into two groups. <clears throat> um, I think either five or six of them were done on koan retreats or other retreats where I was using a koan. So, for example, um, there is no time, what is memory? That was something that John Crook, the Zen teacher, had seen over a monastery in Taiwan or somewhere. Um, and, I, and it rather took my fancy. So what happened on, on these retreats that he ran and went on several of them was you do, they would be a week long retreat. And you would do two days of just basic um, silent illumination practice or, or just sitting practice to get your mind calmed down. And it's a silent retreat, so you're being mindful as much as possible all the time and not speaking and meditating many, many hours a day. And then he gave us all a list of potential koans and sent us off out into the, onto the Welsh mountains where the retreat place is. And uh, to to look at this list and choose one to be our work for the rest of the retreat. And this one jumped out at me. There is no time. What is memory? And so um, then you sat down in all your half hour meditation sessions with brief breaks in between walking around the yard or whatever. Um, You just had to concentrate on this question. And there are many, many ways of working with koans. But his advice was, you know, you, you just sit there and every so often just pop the question into your mind. And it will start with, there is no time, what is memory? Mm. And after a while, you just don't have to say the words to yourself. And I started by, okay, there is no time. Ah, Shall I agree with that or disagree with it? Okay, I'll spend this session agreeing with it. And then I'll spend the next one disagreeing with it. And then there is no memory. Well, maybe there is, maybe there isn't. How does that relate? And a real, like a tree of possibilities. I go through them all and it really, you know. And what I love about John Crook, because he's a British, you know, <laughs> uh, Westerner, you know, is he says, you know, that's what Westerners do. We, we, we do it. We do it all that analytic stuff. He said, don't try and block it. You know, don't pretend to be kind of, you know, whatever. And just, let, you know, do it because it will wear itself out. So he was exactly right. So that process, I've never stopped myself from doing that process with any koan. I'll go at it really analytically until the analysis wears out. And when it wears out, then you're just sitting there and every so often the question spontaneously comes up and you begin to find out things about memory. I can remember on that particular retreat looking into the fire in the evening. This is a very old farmhouse with no gas or electricity or anything like that. And we just the only light would be some candles or and, and the fire. And I was looking at these flames um, and just oh, 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 what is time? Everything's moving and changing, but in, in a way I can't really do justice to in words, but some people will, will probably know what I mean, just having had similar experience. You, sort of time completely disintegrated <laughs> with this flickering flames, and then the memory, uh, then that goes with it. And you know, all sorts of weird things happen when you, you, you tackle an interesting koan. So, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> um, several of them were done like that in a formal setting of a koan retreat for a week. The others were done on solitary retreat in, oh, some were done on solitary retreat up in Wales in the same place by myself. Um, But several were done in my garden shed. (laughs) And what I did then, and I've done it since, and I live in a different place now. I've done it here as well. I would choose a time when my husband and kids were were not there and I got the house to myself. 
so I'd sleep in the house, but I'd get up in the morning and and have um, go out to this to my garden shed essentially, where I had a kettle and some simple food or whatever, and I would stay there all day and be, it, treat it like a, a retreat and do exactly the same kind of thing. Start with a couple of days of just meditation, then start working on the koan, go through the whole analytical thing. Um, but the difference here. Um, was that every evening I'd come in and have a, um, a, a a proper meal, like hot, you know, in the kitchen, and um, and then sit down at my computer. I didn't want to have too much light, and I just sat down with a very dim light, and I just wrote without stopping, without correcting, without thing. It just poured out what had happened that day, and then I'd go back and do some more evening meditation, and then go to bed and do the whole thing again. So that by the end I'd have perhaps four or five five days of um, of all these written notes and they were the basis on which I then wrote the book. Okay. And do you think uh, a meditation practice can be beneficial for someone considering a, a career in academia? Do you think the two can kind of complement each other? I, I'm not sure. I mean, in a way, I would say meditation is wonderful for anybody, but your question is more more specific than that. I mean, I think if you are if you're the kind of thinker or scientist interested in the kind of things I'm interested in, altered states of consciousness, the nature of mind, what is consciousness anyway, uh, why are we here, what's the meaning of it all, you know, then to learn to understand your own mind, to see how it works, to see how things arise and what happens to them and what the reactions are, is all part of, of, of those questions. So if you're interested in those, then absolutely I think it can. If you want, if you're doing more like, I don't know, lab based kind of science, um, I mean, it will help you as a person because it clarifies your mind and calms you down and things like that. Um, but I wouldn't think it would very specifically help. No, but okay. I, don't, I don't really know. OK, um, I, I, I want to ask you a question now about about ayahuasca and feel free to you don't have to answer this or not. But um, could you t maybe tell us about some of your experiences working with ayahuasca and yeah, what's that been like for you? <laughs> um, you know, sometimes I, I, I find the whole um, a memory of the place where I have had this ayahuasca in, in the south of Brazil um, just comes to me as though there's a sort of longing inside me to be back there and to do the ayahuasca again. Um, and on the other hand, there's this terrible f feeling of... Uh, the, the, let me tell you first I've been twice to this place in Brazil whereas there's 12 days and you have four ayahuasca sessions with two days in between so that you kind of get over it before you get the next one and the first time that I took it there's all these people there's only two of us were beginners in the group there and the other beginner and I um, sort of clung to each other you know um, and all the other people were going oh the smell oh the taste oh it's the most disgusting thing in the world oh we smelled this thing it smelled very much knocked it back and taste wasn't particularly pleasant but it wasn't unpleasant you know by the second time I'm thinking oh that is a bit nasty well now I can tell you all I have to do is I'm doing it now I can feel it I can feel my mouth sort of watering the rather unpleasant I just think of the smell of that ayahuasca mixture and my whole body's going no no don't you know and I've had times I've had times on the bathroom floor, you know, with a bucket, with a plastic bag in it, throwing up and throwing up and going, just remember, never, ever do this again. Just never, ever do this. Just remember, you mustn't ever do this again. And then, of course, I'm like, I want to do this again. I mean, that is the weirdest drug. Um, I would say it's by far the weirdest drug um, that I've ever had. Um, and you asked me a question that I can't really answer. I mean, it's very hard to remember, uh, usually of an acid trip or mescaline or whatever I can usually remember um, I smoke a lot of cannabis I use it a lot for kind of just thinking about things in a different way and I'm usually very organized in my cannabis induced thinking and sometimes I write it down mostly I don't but you know I, 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 I'm very organized ayahuasca just sends you into I don't know what I can remember I did a lot of work on my relationship with one of my kids in the last sessions and I felt it was really helpful and really advantageous. But quite what happened, I really can't remember. 
Um, it's a very, very strange drug. And I don't know whether to believe more the, oh, no, I mustn't do it, or believe more the, uh, yeah, yeah, I want to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's poison, <laughs> isn't it? Um, so I don't know. Could you tell me about your views on free will and maybe could you talk about, uh, I think I heard you mention an interview before about William James getting out of bed on a, on a cold winter morning and talk about how these two kind of relate to each other. Oh, yes. That, that, William James is my absolutely great hero. He wrote some wonderful things, including the varieties of mystical experience. Uh, sorry, varieties of religious experience. But um, the sort of Bible of his work is uh, Principles of Psychology, 1890. Two volumes, 1,100 pages, the most marvelous book. Um, and he says that he's talking about um, how we make ourselves do things when we don't want to. And, of course, this is before central heating or anything. And he says, imagine yourself in a, in a cold, cold bedroom with no fire and a warm covers. And you, you've got to get up, but you, everything, in, I wish I could, uh, para, you know, I wish I could remember it precisely. But something like he says, your whole body um, rebels against getting up in the cold. Um, and then I ask myself, well, how do I ever get up? The answer is, I, I eventually, I found I just have got up. And I think that is is true of so much of what we do. We then retrospectively say, oh, I decided to get up and I got up. But he's being clearer. He's observing his mind more clearly. And he is noticing that, no, that is not what happened. He just got up and, oh, I'm up and got on with it. I use this often in my own life when I don't want to do something. I just sort of let it happen and then it does. He, he used this himself to talk about... Um, um, psychomotor action the the fact that if you um if you think about carrying out an action you're more likely to do it um and so in a way if you're lying there thinking about it actually the way to get up i mean nowadays because we most of us don't have absolutely freezing rooms although if you're perhaps out camping in a tent and it's below zero you know then it might be a similar thing i can't get out of my sleeping bag um, but if you just imagine, you're saying, I really don't want to, but I'll just imagine it, <laughs> then that's more likely you're, you're going to do it. Um, or perhaps get out of the shower. I mean, I'm very good at having only three minute showers, but I, I can imagine some people, they just like staying in the shower and, you know, don't want to get out. Well, just imagine turning off the tap and it's more likely, it's more likely to happen. Um, so uh, where does free will come into that? I long, long, long ago, um, well, you asked me about my whole, whole life and I, when I was a PhD student, um, I can remember having big arguments with my um, then boyfriend, who is now a philosophy professor at Exeter, um, about free will. And he was writing um, a thesis on the weakness of the will. And so we had endless arguments about it. So I, I know that re even back then I thought, look, you know, brains are just doing stuff. Um, they're doing it's all interconnected. And it goes from, you know, um, input in the eyes and, and the output in the arms and the mouth and you know, all these things, um, where is there room for magic? It would have been magic. Of course, this came after my disillusionment with the paranormal and becoming much more interested in how can a physical brain give rise to, you know, being a human with, 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 um, with, a, with mind, with, with thoughts um, and with intentions. And so I was pretty sure then that, that there is no such thing as free will. There's will. And there are choices that we make, but there's no free. The, the will isn't free. It's part of the mechanism. And so I systematically made myself, and I have done all my life, made myself live not believing in free will. And people say it's impossible. It's not impossible. I've had so many people, like in my other book, um, Conversations on Consciousness, I asked a whole lot of um, consciousness people, um, philosophers, scientists, and so on, do you have free will? And several of them said, well, you know, most of them said yes, but some of them said, well, you know, I know there isn't technically free will, but you have to live as if free will. Otherwise, and even Dan Dennett says this, otherwise the law would collapse and society would break down. Because I think if you live without free will, it means you accept that the me, the thing that I think I am, is the tiniest bit of a, it's a constructed entity in the brain. It's not in charge of the whole brain. It's not in charge of the whole body. It just thinks it is, just says it is. But if you let 
the body get out of bed in a cold morning, it will do so. And actually, on the whole, if you stop thinking that I've got to make this happen, things happen actually quite well. Yeah, okay. Well, so you think that's all we've got time for today. I just want to say thanks so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. And you're giving a talk with us at the end of September. Um, we'll, mm. we'll include a link for that in the show notes. Um, where can people find you online, Sue? Uh, SusanBlackmore.uk. Quite straightforward. But all you have to do is put my name in Google and you'll find my website, which I hope people will enjoy. I also have a Facebook page. It's not a, like a personal one. It's a, like a, I don't know what they call it, um, a, a work sort of Facebook page. And I do put up, you know, regularly things that are happening. Um, uh, at the moment, it's got a podcast I did the other day um, for an American site. Uh, so those are the two ways ways to see. And I must say, I enjoyed your questions. Um, it was rather fun, very self-indulgent, but um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was fun answering them. Well, great talking to you, Sue, and I'll see you soon, okay? See you in September, yeah. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>